Hello everybody and welcome back to the Rodea the Sky Soldier playthrough. It's time for chapter 7. His name is Orthos. Or Orthos. Uh, either way, as you can probably guess, we're going to be facing down Orthos in this mission. But first we've got to get to the arena because Orthos has a uh, clear sense of the dramatic. And he feels that it is necessary to do battle in the middle of um, a coliseum. Now, here's yet another new enemy, because we're just going to get thrown so many of these. I mean, it's fine by me, because they're all really quite cool designs, and each enemy is generally pretty unique. There is probably the argument that could be made that the game tends to, well, pretty much does blow out most of its enemies very, very early on. For example, uh, you've experienced the majority of the enemies that you're ever going to face come kind of halfway through the game. There's perhaps only one enemy type that ends up being brand new in like the final stretch. Outside of the bosses, obviously. But I think because each enemy is so unique in the way it um, works, I really don't care because you never feel kind of like they're wasting enemies, like there's not enough variety in the enemies. Because kind of there is a lot of variety, you just kind of see them very, very early on. Also, this is probably one of the only instances of sort of slow backtracking that I decided to do, if only because I saw that uh, Legacy Medal there and I wanted it. Why the hell not? I'm not going for all of them, but I might as well get some, eh? <laughs> Show you what you can do kind of just going on the main path. And that Legacy Medal has caused me to completely lose my train of thought, which is rather embarrassing. But I think I was talking about the kind of variety of enemies. And there is a pretty great variety. I mean, in the first seven levels, we faced sort of a general mook that can't really attack us other than if we just kind of accidentally rammed face first into it. A spiked version of that enemy, which retracts and grows spikes, so you can't always just, you know, ram into it. You've got to kind of time things properly. You've got the uh, spider rocket launchers, which are slightly terrifying. You've got these cannons. You've got the kind of rocket launcher turtles, which are defeated in a different way because you have to hit them three times once to kind of put them off balance, another time to knock them over, and another time to defeat them. You have the flying plane enemies, the small variants, and the big war planes. You also have the multi-segmented flying insects enemies, so that's another type. You also have the mysterious orb enemies with the rings around them that shoot the purple kind of legs of rings at you. So that's, I think, every single enemy type that we have faced in the first seven or eight levels. There are even more types of enemy throughout the game. And they do keep throwing them at you. You may have seen kind of the majority of them before you get kind of 
too far in the game, but because each enemy has its own unique way of being defeated, but it all follows through into the same core gameplay mechanics, it just works. There's no need to uh, kind of have a different visual design for every enemy you're going to face because each enemy is so different. Also, these guys are quite cool. They are sort of balloon octopuses. Or octopi, I suppose, is probably technically correct. They can be a little bit finicky. Because if you don't begin to... If you don't have them targeted and kind of flying towards them before they've kind of begun their lift off, you're going to have to wait. And I do mean you're going to have to wait for them to come all the way back down, all kind of pop and then another one spawn. It's a little bit frustrating, but... Oh well. Now this is a rather mean section. <laughs> If you haven't learnt how to deal with your uh, parabolic arcs yet, this is going to test you, well and truly. Because you can't go too high, you can't go too far below, or too far to the left. Now that is actually, that's a legacy medal that is actually in this kind of chamber with you. I would get it, but um, I think I just sort of chickened out a little bit. I'm going to get the kind of silver one on top of it. But that one, I think I was just like, mm, no, it's not worth it. That one's a risk I was not willing to take. But then, oh yes, there's this enemy that I completely ignored at the end of Beneath the Desert Sky. Obviously, it's got the big kill me light on the bottom. Uh, easily defeated if you have got the machine gun. Um, but you can simply defeat it by kind of ramming into it with the boost attack as well. It's a little bit more finicky because obviously once you've used a boost attack, you kind of hit the enemy, you bounce off, and then you've got to kind of reorient yourself and get your attack in. But it's still a perfectly viable way of defeating the enemy. It's just a little bit more challenging overall. I think if you are in the other versions of the game, you are going to struggle with that particular enemy. Because the gameplay mechanics just aren't really meant to deal with them. They're the type of enemy that requires fluidity of motion to be able to deal with effectively, essentially. Yes, I think one of the greatest elements of this game is the fact that you have such freedom of movement. Like, you can fly wherever you can kind of get your pointer to kind of lock on to. And while obviously the game has a very linear progression to it, you've still got the option to kind of just fly around at whatever pace you like, do whatever you'd like, really. It's just... It's, it's just really cool! Now... I don't know whether this is... timed... or what? It's a very simple... trap in massive air quotation marks. But... Still, it makes good use of our flying abilities, so why the hell not? Oh, come on, it's not that deadly, Rodea. That explains quite a lot. That is what you get for that, Ion. A slow clap. That is all that one deserves. <laughs> but there we go. 
That trap was very, very easily dealt with. But here is Orthos. Orthos. Whatever. And I, I still like that they still want to call him Olmi, which is just adorable. <laughs> I really do like um, his design. It's really quite cool. It's sort of the bluey, turquoisey colour that I'm really quite fond of. I think it might actually be almost an identical colour to the kind of colour that I have for my channel and my website. So perhaps that's why I kind of relate to uh, Orthos a little bit more than I would otherwise. He's not really that hard, I mean, look, he, he's already defeated, but he's a cool little enemy, or well, cool little boss, shall I say. You were once an ally of the Naga Empire. I just feel like I need to protect it. That's impossible! You're supposed to reject any order that defies our Emperor. You, little old me, we were all designed that way. You're right. Yeah. It wasn't an order. Huh. It was something else entirely. It was a promise. You mean her. Her? It seems you truly remember nothing at all. Yeah. I don't know who I made my promise to. Or even who you are, Orthos. <laughs> so you finally remember, little old me? Yeah, I do. My name was given to me by His Majesty Emperor Giardo. Your name. Your name came not from his majesty, but from her instead. I... I was so jealous of your awesome name. Orthos! Rodea! Rodea! Yeah. Did you do it? Yeah. What's the matter? Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Let's go to the next tower. And that is the end of Orthos. It's time to move onwards to chapter 8. Let's do this.